Hey, welcome to Dan's Model Works, and today is new project day. Yay! Now here we have a Tamiya F16 in 148 scale. This is, as you can tell by the box art, it's the original prototype and the first version in service. Now I got this kit about four years ago at my local IPMS flea market. I think I paid, oh, $15 for it. And I figured, well, $15 for a 148 scale Tamiya kit, I really couldn't go too wrong with that. And other than the fact that the box has been opened, the kit is untouched. Everything is still in the bags, except for the main fuselage. And this was a new tooling in 1976, as we'll see when we get inside it. I don't know how long Tamiya kept it in production themselves and kept it in their box. Usually Tamiya tends to leave things in production for quite a while. Now... According to the Scalemates website, it was also marketed by Hobbycraft in 1976, 77, and in 1980, and then finally in the new box in 1990. Also, Idea had it available in 1977 and finally twice in the 90s. It was uh, released by a company called Kittyland. So obviously, Tamiya was fairly liberal in who they were allowing to market this. Now, I don't know, because according to the Scalemate site, they never released it again under their own name after the, the initial offering. So quite possibly they said, all right, we're going to do the, the newer versions in service and we're not going to bother with this one. If we take a look at the box, it's pretty standard to me affair. We look on the side here, they include a pilot figure and we have these two paint schemes available. And this is the one I'm probably going to do. Now... I built an F-16 in 148 scale. It was the monogram model, I believe, in the late 70s. And, of course, I butchered it. You butchered everything, Dan. Yeah. So, I thought it would be nice to actually do a decent job of it. And if we look on the side, here were some of the kits that were also available at the time. You got the Harrier, Brewster Buffalo, Lancaster, and the Zero. So let's see what we got here. Let's see what we're getting into. So as I mentioned earlier, other than the main fuselage halves being outside the bag, and I think probably that was the way it was actually released, everything is still bagged up. One thing I did notice when upon inspecting this a couple days ago is that, uh, get a little bit better into the light here, and... It's difficult to see, but the panel lines are raised on this, which is a little surprising for a Tamiya kit. However, we have to remember this was tooled in the 1970s, and most aircraft kits at that time had raised panel lines. So this isn't completely unreasonable. However, they are very, very faint. They're not really, they're not like huge ridges or anything like that. And I'm probably not going to be shaving them down in scribing them in. So let's take a look at the rest of the parts. Let's get this out of the way. So we've got the instructions. We've got the Tamiya Model Club of Canada. And we've got the decals. And they look fairly nice. A little bit of yellowing. I guess I'm going to tape these to the window and make sure we can get them all cleared up in the sunlight. So I'm thinking there's one, two, three, four four sprues plus the fuselage. So let's take a look at them and get them out of the bag. I think before we take a close look at the parts, let's take a quick look at the uh, instructions. We've got a nice picture of the, the built-up model here on the cover. We've got it looks like in uh, two languages. Looks like English and German. And then we open it up. And then over here we've got the painting guide for both paint schemes and then this is it this is it we've got what five six steps so we've got putting together the inside of the fuselage uh, decals for the instruments that's not the end of the world um, putting together the basic fuselage popping the wings on then we've got landing gear and we've got, looks like some drop tanks. Doesn't look like they give us any bombs. 
And then they have a guide on painting the pilot figure. And then, of course, down here we've got some final assembly. Not a whole lot to this. It's not like the giant book that Ravel insists on giving us. So looking at the parts, let's look at the fuselage again. It uh, seems to go together fairly well. It's not like you're, during the test fitting, you're having to struggle to get it together. There's a little bit of detail inside the landing gear bays there. Let's get a little closer so you can see that. There we go. So I don't see anything is too terrible there. So you maybe look at some pictures and see if there's any scope for super detailing, but I don't really want to get bogged down into this project. I, I want an F-16, but I'm not going to be entering it in a contest. So then we move on to this sprue and realize I'm the first person, a human being, to touch this in 36 years. Oh. We have the wings, and it looks like these inserts go inside the wings. And here's our, our nose, and the back of the engine, the air intake, and looks like parts of the forward strakes. And once again, raised panel lines, but I'm not going not gonna to let that bother me too much. We have this next sprue, and we have the, the stabilators, and the vertical tail, and let's focus in on the landing gear. Looks well done. And is this guy mooning us or what here? Let's turn this around. There we go. There's our pilot figure. And seat looks pretty good. Um... I wouldn't say it's super detailed, but I mean, it, it certainly is well done. I, I don't, you know, it's better than a lot of the horribly old kits that I tend to build. And then we have this sprue with the drop tanks. It looks like that's about the only thing that gives you, other than the sidewinders for the ends of the wings of these giant fuel tanks. And we have a couple of loose parts floating around in the box. This... Looks like the nose gear bay. And we got two of these. These must be the, the fronts of the, our drop tanks. And there's the, the back of the engine. This kit doesn't give you a removable engine or anything like that, but at least there's some detail there. It's not just a plain blanked off plate. And we've got this little piece. I was worried about this little piece. I was afraid it wasn't in the box. wonder what it's for. And, of course, now we get down to the transparencies. And this would be our heads-up display. And then we've got two other little tiny lights here. And then we have our canopy. And some of you are probably looking at it and going, Oh, my God, there is a seam going across the top. Of the canopy and I admit at first this is looks like a sort of thing you'd be like how could they've done that but this is actually the sign of a model company has cared about what they're doing and they're molding an F-16 because an F-16 the canopy is let's try to get an end view here it actually is more than 180 degrees going around it actually bulges on either side and the only way you can mold that is with a three-piece mold so what we have to do is you have to sand off that seam with probably some k &S sandpaper and then your next step there is, is to repolish it and if you're not sure how to do that there are kits that you can get at uh, car repair places you use them for polishing your headlights your polycarbonate headlights and the same sort of kits will also polish this and get that looking nice and smooth so that's that's everything. That's all the parts. Let's take this thing over to the clutter zone and start working on it. Oops, looks like the clutter zone is a little too cluttered. Better get that cleaned up before we get started on the F-16. There, and it's that simple. Just wave your hand and it's all cleaned up. So the instructions would have us start inside the cockpit. But having been so blasé about how easy it is to polish out this seam line on top of the canopy. I thought, you know what, let's get this done first. 
And that way, if I screw this up, this whole project never will see the light of day. We'll pretend it never happened. Now, what we need to do first is to use some sanding film, and I have various different grades here, to get the line off the top. And then we go finer and finer grades until finally we use the polishing compound. Oh no, what have I done? The humidity of it all. All right, that was the most aggressive sandpaper, which it was in fact very, very fine. And we've got the basic line sanded off. From here on in, we're gonna end up actually widening out a bit as we sand, but we will be polishing the whole thing out as we go to progressively finer grades of sandpaper. So here's our second grade of sandpaper. And as you can see, it's starting to regain some of its transparency. So here we go after the next grade of sandpaper. And as you can see, the, the clarity is starting to return. Now there might be one more grade of sandpaper somewhere, but I've lost it seeing as this is the glitter zone. So I'm gonna move on to the polishing compound. So here's our plastic polish. It's made by Permatex. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the sort of thing that you get from auto parts stores and things like that for restoring your headlights. And what you do is you basically apply it um, using a Q-tip or a cloth or something like that. And then you allow it to dry and then you polish it off just the same as if you were using rubbing compound or wax or something like that. The polishing compound is dried. And it's just like putting wax on a car. You wait till it's fully dried and then you start to wipe it off. And you use the polishing cloth that they give you in the set that you get from the auto parts store. And here's the finished product. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I think I was probably missing my finest grade of sandpaper. The Permatex probably did about 90% of the uh, scratch removal, but there were still some that were a little stubborn. So what I ended up doing was, I have some turtle wax polishing compound. And I think it's a little bit more aggressive than the Permatex. So I went and did several applications of that. I think we've got it nice and clear now. So while I was futzing around with the canopy and polishing it out. In order to kill some time, I started working on the cockpit itself. Now you can see the decals have been applied to the sides. And you know what, they, they don't look as good as if, let's say, the detail was molded in and then you put a decal on top, or if you manage to paint all the little switches and dials and things. But I think when you consider the amount of distortion that we have inner transparency even after it's been polished. Kind of what's the point in, in worrying about any kind of a 3D effect with these switches and dials and things. I think it'll look fine once we put it all together. Here's our cockpit tub fully assembled. If it looks a little short, it's because the seat kind of makes up the rest of it. And I think given the state of our canopy, which is nice and clear, there's still an awful lot of distortion to it. Like it's kind of wavy and everything like that. So to super detail this cockpit any more beyond this, I think would be a waste of time. Remember I said there was no flash? Well, not much flash. So the only flash I've seen so far is just at the front end of the supports for the pilot seat. Of course, yes, this is an old kit, but this is basically dates back to when it was first released. So here's the seat. Now I was going to call it done. And then I made the mistake of going on the internet to make sure that I had painted that handle correctly and it is an ejection handle. And I got to looking at pictures of the real seats plus uh, seats that uh, have come in much later kits. And this one, well, although it's not terrible, is a little skimpy on detail. So I think I'm going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to add just a couple things. Mostly I'm going to add another ejection handle right here on the side. There seems to be some little antler-like things that come off the top, which I'm assuming are for knocking the canopy out of the way. And there's a, a rather visible bottle 
on the side here, plus a box up there. I think I'm going to add those things and then, then I'll call the seat finished. It won't be super detailed, but there'll be a little bit more than what Tamiya originally gave us. So there's those few added details I said I was going to add. We've got the handle on the right side. We've got that pressure bottle on the side. And then we've got the, the two probes or horns or canopy breakers, whatever you want to call them. Well, my daughters just call them in the tenai. So they've been added on. So next step is, is I'll touch up all those with some paint and then our seat will finally be done. There's our seat with the additional details added onto it and a black wash applied. And this is ready to be installed. I've painted the insides of the cockpit this medium gray color. Pretty much everything in the cockpit is supposed to be gray or light gray. So I'm just using the old adage of try to use two or three different versions of the same color in order to create more detail. Now the cockpit floor actually fits on or fits into a very tight set of mounting spot there and there. And since I'm trying to do it on camera, it won't go in smoothly. There we go. Unlike a lot of other kits where there's just kind of a line and you're just supposed to stick the cockpit in there and hope for the best. This, once you get it in place, it's not going anywhere. The only thing it needs to be adjusted is the tab right here sits a little proud. I noticed that it tends to keep the fuselage halves from coming together all the way. So I'm going to trim that down before I glue this in place. Now to me, has put some serious engineering into mounting some of the parts. This is the air brake that goes on either side of the, the engine. And as you can see, this one's not going on because it's the wrong one. This is the one that does belong on there. As you can see, it does fit pretty good. But when we look at it from the side, you can see that it actually stands a little proud at the top. And there's a bit of a step at the bottom. So whereas these two big lugs are appreciated for making sure that you don't mess it up, they kind of prevent you from getting a perfect fit. So I'm going to be lopping those off and then I'm just going to be mashing this into place and, and getting a slightly better fit. Although their, their paranoia and making sure that you get the part on the right side is appreciating because I can see me screwing that up, but you can see the, you can see the, the, the edge there that the lugs end up creating. Okay. There's our air brake glued in place and it's still not an absolutely perfect fit, but at least it's not favoring the top or the bottom. It, you know, any misalignment is shared amongst the top and the bottom. Now the fuselage is not yet glued together, as you can tell by the, the splitting that's going on, but it does stay together quite well without any glue. And the reason I've got it mocked up like this is I'm, it looks like you can assemble the landing gear and then pop it out of place. I could be wrong. The reason I want to do that is, is if I can put the landing gear basically together at the same time, I can spray paint the landing gear white and the bay is white. And because nothing is harder than painting white. And if you're brush painted, it oftentimes looks crappy. And this is a, a wide open area underneath the plane. So I want to do a, a nice coat of white paint on there that I can later put a wash on to bring out that detail. So this way I can get the landing gear all basically one piece and then I can pop it back in later. You didn't get to see the first wing get put together because I forgot to turn the camera on, but not a whole lot to it. There's basically a panel that goes on the underside here. It's a fairly precise fit. Now there are two little drill hair points. Now they're actually quite large. So I'm thinking that the attachment points for the drop tanks are, are pretty, pretty large. Now what I did on the other wing is I just drilled very, very small holes. I'm not planning on using those giant tanks they give you, but at some later date, I might want to put a pylon on there with some bombs or something like that. So that way, if I've at least got those little tiny holes, they generally won't show and I can always widen them out later if I want to put another pylon on. So this part actually goes on without any fuss or muss. There's a little bit of uh, looseness here, but I'm going to put it on so it favors this and leave a little bit of gap here because this obviously is for the flaps.
Oh, and I'm also going to drill out the little holes. I've successfully removed the assembled landing gear, or the rear landing gear, from the bay. I'll be able to just put a clothespin on it and airbrush the whole thing. And then I should just be able to pop it back in place and glue it on with some super glue later on. That's the plan. Now, while test fitting the fuselage halves, I've been glancing up in the air intake and they don't really give you a blocking plate or anything like that in this kit. So you can see all the way back to what would be the tail of the engine. Now, if you're looking in there right now, you can see that one half of it is black, come sa. And I'm gonna paint the same area on this fuselage half. And I haven't determined yet whether this is gonna be my final solution. I could just put a backing plate right in here. I have not yet completely decided what I'm gonna do. Depending on what this looks like, after I paint both sides flat black inside, I'll be making a decision. Either I'm going to blank this off or I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm going to uh, simulate the front of the engine here. Because when you look up inside an F-16, you can actually see the engine in the air intake. So we'll have to see what I, what I decide to do. So... I'm not going to paint any more of the interior of this than necessary, and I've already figured out from the other side just how far I have to go. Alrighty, there's that side all blacked out. Like I said, I haven't made a final decision as to whether it's going to be a, a blanking plate up here, which case this black was a waste of time, or whether it's going to be just leave it black and hollow, or whether I'm going to put a simulated engine front in there. Stay tuned. So here's our view looking up into the air intake with the actual lip in place just to make sure that, you know, we're not seeing anything we shouldn't. And... You can see in there pretty good. Like I said, we will have to see. So our seat has been test fitted inside there. And this segment has gone on a little bit longer than I originally anticipated. So I think we're going to be wrapping it up for this week. So until next time, thanks for watching Dan's Model Works and keep on modeling.